spare his son, but he can't be presence with thanksgiving with praise and adoration for who you are you are a wonderful loving kind God we've partaken of your mercy and we thank you so much this morning for bringing us together you said we are two or three of us are gathered together there you are in the midst so we know you are here and so we welcome you by the power of your spirit thank you Lord God that you have so called us together to impart some things to us today that will help us prepare for the journey ahead. And so we bless you. And we thank you right now for your word that's about to come. We reverence your word. We receive your word. We bless your name for your word. And we thank you for the word. Thank you, Father, for your vessel in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your seats. Sir, and welcome everybody, everybody this morning uh, to Pastor Melvin and Julia. Thank you so much. We welcome you. Charles and Freda, thanks. We, we see you. We welcome you. Thank you so much. And for all of you, all of you that are here, thank you so much for joining us this morning because the table is spread and we are going to be fed very well. Amen. Very, very well. Amen. I truly believe we're in a season where the wagons are coming. Amen. For some of us, it's arrived. For others, it's on the way. Amen. But we just want to make sure you have the necessary tools so that when your wagons arrive, you know how to unload them. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Dr. Handy is not a uh, stranger to this house. Uh, he's a father in the house, and we thank God for uh, allowing him to spend a few minutes with us this morning. And so you already know what you're in for. It's an apostolic voice to this generation, and he's been speaking, blasting the trumpet all over the nations. Uh, I was just telling him a few minutes ago, he just came back from Scotland. Uh, so uh, uh, I just thank God for how God has used him uh, in this house and all over the world. Uh, he talks about government, order, alignment, and I don't know anybody else that can unveil, uh, break open the seals of the word of God when it comes to present day truth. Uh, I, mean, I don't know if you guys were here last September when they came to preach to us on come with me to the sacrifice. <laughs> oh my god oh wow 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 but anyway don't let me say too much more uh so right now it's 11 16 we're going to give him the podium and he's going to just talk to us and hopefully at the end if you have any questions we can dialogue for a few more minutes amen and so right now i just want you to welcome with me dr mark hamley oh i love you thank you Hang on. Hello, hello. There we are. Thank you, Pastor. Hi, and the Rose of Sharon. And, and uh, somebody asked me the other day, said, who are those folks you go to see down south of Atlanta? I said, oh, you mean down in Baskin Robbins? They said, and they said, they live in an ice cream store? And I said, I said oh, no, 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 that's Warner Robbins. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to see the Womax there, a blessing. And... Uh, I promise, Julia, next time Tess will come, they are dangerous together. <clears throat> I am glad to see all of you, sons, daughters, grandchildren. I met someone that I ministered to, what, 30 years ago? In the Bronx. Grand Concourse. Was it 185th and Grand Concourse? Some, yep. Many, many years ago. In Atlanta. Well, uh, uh, 30 years ago. <clears throat> wow. Uh, which may tell you something, but I'd rather you didn't mention it, okay? <laughs> I have uh, the wonderful blessing and privilege of doing this morning what I was born to do, and that is to be able to share with you the unspeakable riches of his grace. Today, uh, Pastor and I have discussed this briefly. We're going to talk about a subject that 
uh, is to us and to me most exciting and uh, I think one of the most revealing and glorious truths of the entire Bible. It is, in my opinion. It is the glorious truth of the New Testament. But to many in Christendom, uh, things that are very apparent to some of us are hidden to others. This is, this is what we have to understand. Uh, you are blessed to be in this house with this apostolic ministry uh, speaking to you eternal truths that are relevant to not only to the times but to who you are as it relates to the times. We were speaking uh, in the office just a little while ago about uh, my trip. I've just recently returned, as Pastor said, from Scotland. I was in South Africa uh, earlier, about 45 days ago or so, and God really dealt with me, spoke with me, and, and told me, I want you to go to Scotland. And I love Scotland as a, as a country, as a, as a beautiful area of the world. Scotland, in my opinion, is one of the most beautiful places in the whole world. I love the highlands. I love the moors. I love to drive around through there on the wrong side of the road. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and I asked the Lord, why Scotland? And, and then it came into my mind, into my spirit, the British Isles, Europe. Here we are working in Mexico. I'm also working in Canada right now in some very interesting areas. Mexico has become a hotbed for uh, reformation and revival. And then, yeah, and then uh, I have also uh, been working towards South America, but uh, South Africa, I won't take time to talk about that in detail, but we have an enormous reformation taking place also in Africa. Now, I know that many of you have root systems in, uh, in the western part of, of uh, Africa. Uh, I was actually supposed to be in Nigeria uh, back early. It was in February, March, March, I think. I was supposed to be in Nigeria with uh, Tunde. Yeah. And uh, we were going to do the conference, and then things happened in the government. Some things changed. I was going from there on to South Africa, so I just went straight to South Africa, and we had a, an enormous happening in the spirit. Then I went back 60 days later, so I've been there twice already this year. But while I was there, God spoke to me about Europe and then told me, go go to Scotland. And I wondered, why Scotland? And because it is the uppermost, northernmost part. I want you to look down on it. And so I got up into the mountains and up into the old cathedrals, and I prayed in each one of those from place to place, you know, what, God, what are you saying? What are you saying? And God spoke to me and said, this land is barren of spirituality. Barren. Nothing. And so I started looking at the Christian, I don't want to bore you with this, but I started looking at the Christian involvement there is still a war going on in the, it's not just a war as in shooting people, but it is a bitterness and anger between Catholicism and Protestantism. You would know if you are any recent history student uh, of the war in Ireland between the Irish Catholics and the Protestants. They literally killed over 100,000 people uh, over religious politics in Ireland in the past years. And now in Scotland, they won't even let the Catholic children go to school, the same public school with the Protestant children. If they do go, they have to go to different parts of the building. So there, there's that, that old thing from uh, 400 years ago, 500 years ago is still going on. But so I thought, well, we're Protestant. We're not Catholic. We're Protestant. So what are the Protestants doing? And and it was interesting uh, because when I started looking for the spiritual places or hotbeds, I couldn't find any. The only thing I found were that people would go into the, into the old cathedrals or they would go into the old churches and sit for an hour. Sometimes they didn't even have a minister. They would just go sit and look. And one of their themes is, behold the beauty of the place. Think of this. 
So they go in and they look at all the arches and all of the stones and all of the, behold the beauty of the place. That's not much spirituality, I'm sorry. <laughs> so if we came in here and for now we sat around and said, mm, I really like the way these beams are. I like the way the lights and the sound system and, you know, that, that's, their, that's, their, that's their Christianity. So after a while, it just dawned on me that all of these buildings that have been built hundreds of years ago in all of that northern Britain, and I, don't, I, I promise I'll, I'll get on something else here right away, but it dawned on me that while we are over here enjoying a powerful spiritual tide, there are places in the world where there is no spiritual influence. And uh, so then it came into my spirit, and this is what I was trying to get to. In this nation where we are, you know, we are in the Bible Belt, we're, if you were to count the number of churches in Atlanta, for example, all over this city, they are hundreds, there are hundreds, there are literally thousands of places of worship in this central Georgia area. Not all of them have the same spiritual experience that you have. And that's why I think today we need to at least, uh, when our uh, praise leader was speaking about our minds, we need, to, we need to let our minds grasp and understand that some of the things we are teaching and talking about by revelation, let's all say by revelation, we should thank God for him revealing himself to us. We should be grateful and hungry for spiritual revelation because it's possible to go hundreds of years, 400, 500 years, and never have him revealed. And if you have that, there should be a deep hunger. Let's all say hunger. And, and hunger should make you want to reach out and grasp something. This happened to me in my ministry uh, many years ago. I was pastoring in the building, pastor, where you've been uh, in, in Fort Worth, Texas. I was pastoring and had pastored about 10 years in that place. We had built $15 million of facilities. That's back a long time ago. That's nearly 40 years ago. We had built all of those facilities. We had all of those programs. We built townhouses and apartments and all of those things. And this was the largest church in my organizational structure internationally. And here I am, a young pastor, and all excited. And then I started receiving revelation. And this revelation was counter to everything that I was preaching because I was the great power preacher of judgment and of uh, get right, get ready, do right. And I certainly do think we need to be right and do all of that, be ready. But suddenly I came on this whole thing, and I'm going to read to you here. I came on this whole thing that changed so much of my thinking. I was in prayer one day, and I was reading from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. When I, here we are, when I saw that, I had read it dozens and dozens of times, but when I read that scripture that day in prayer, my whole world exploded. All of a sudden in me, Pastor, and this is a long time ago, when I started preaching grace, my revelation of the grace of God, and I've said this in many places, I get criticized for this, I'm sorry, but my revelation concerning the grace of God, and I had been pastor for a long time, was greater to me than my baptism in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to say that to you again. How many of you have received a baptism in the Holy Ghost? Let me see your hands. You received a baptism. My revelation of the grace of God exploded in me in a greater measure than my receiving a baptism in the Holy Ghost because it made me understand what the Holy Ghost was. 
everything's changed so that the axle of my thinking was not receive the Holy Spirit and then live the best you can, do good. All of a sudden, grace became the axle. All these other things. I found out that I could not worship properly if I didn't understand grace. I found out that I can't pray properly if I don't understand grace. I found out that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is an emotional experience that literally just makes me feel good but really has very little purpose in my life if I don't understand grace. Grace became the axle of my entire understanding. And that's the reason why for years and years I was thinking this morning, I've been preaching and teaching grace. But you have to be careful because in our American churches, in our Holy Ghost churches, in our, in our charismatic churches, people who have spiritual experiences, many of them still have no concept of the grace of God. Am I right? They have no concept. I had no concept. I had people, we were, we, in, the, in those 20 years that I pastored, we baptized 14,870 people in water by, by baptismal record. That's almost 15,000 people, not counting 12 works that we opened beside that. All of that, we did all of that. And still, in the middle of all of that, I did not understand the grace of God. Okay. Does that seem shocking to you? Well, I'm going, to read, I'm, I'm going to read a passage over here from Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, beginning with verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, that by him all that believe are justified. Let's all say justified. <laughs> that all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. I'm going to do that again. <laughs> and by him all that believe, and that's important, all that believe, okay, because it's by grace you're saved through faith, right. All the believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which was spoken of in the prophets. And I'm going to say this not because I think that you do not believe, but I'm going to read this to, uh, I wish I could say it to all of the Christian churches in America, especially those who are still preaching the doctrine of law and grace together. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. This is how I see even in our day. I was thinking this morning, I, there's, another, there's another preacher, another preacher, apostolic preacher that I wish were here today to preach instead of me, okay? Uh, but, but there are several that I know. But the one that I wish were here, uh, who is, in my opinion, the expert on grace, who, in my opinion, is probably the most literate and, and has the greatest revelation. Can I tell you who that is? Paul. Scare, scared you, didn't I? <laughs> scared you. I wish he were here today because he would not mince any words. Because if you put together, see, grace is like a faceless woman. I want you to listen to this. Grace is like an apparition. It's almost like something is there but not quite there. In order for grace to take shape, and have meaning, then you have to put a nose, eyes, ears. That's where justification, sanctification, atonement, all of those put a face on grace. Did, did y'all hear what I just said? 
all of those things. So what we're talking about, what I'm talking today, and I'm going to be talking about justification by faith. When we talk about justification by faith, here, according to the Apostle Paul in this 13th chapter of Acts, he's saying, hey, I hope that you don't get in the shape of people like David was writing about when he had his revelation of the openness of Christ, when he said, you're despisers, and he said, you know, you, are, you, you guys are in big trouble because you're despisers, and uh, you are, let me, let me just read this to you again, despisers, and you need to wander and eventually perish. I will work a work in your day a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. He goes on to say, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought these words that might be preached to them the next Sabbath day. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day uh, came also the whole city to hear the word of the Lord hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and they spoke those things which were spoken by Paul as contradicting and blaspheming. I, I just want to tell you that when you preach grace, when you preach grace in its fullest extent, most of the literal Christian world will consider you to be crazy. When I receive, okay, are you all okay? I'm probably taking too much time on this point, but tomorrow I'm going to be preaching grace. So I, I, just want, I just want to warn you about something. I want to warn you that Jews, let's all say the Jews. Now, these are the ones who were baptized into the mindset of the law of Moses. You have to do this this way. You can't do that. You can't go there. Paul tells them, if you offend the law in one thing, if you offend, then you are guilty of the whole law. If you can't keep every one of those laws. And then the scripture also says, and that's why I wish Paul were here, because he would. I read all of the scriptures early this morning concerning justification, sanctification, atonement. When we talk about justification, you know what the word literally means? To be acquitted. Let's all say to be acquitted. Yeah. You stand before a court, you know you're guilty as you can be, and yet the verdict comes back and says, you're not guilty. Let's all say, I'm not guilty. There, that's why Paul in the seventh chapter said, I am really a mess because the things I would not do, I do. The things I would do, I do not. Oh, wretched man. No, this is, he's talking about his humanity. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And he uses there an ephemism. He uses there a picture of old Roman cruelty. When a man was guilty of killing another man, they would take the body of the man that he killed often, and they would put it on his back. They would take leather straps, wrap it around him, and then they would wet those straps so that they would shrink, so that that body was literally bound to him, so that he would walk around with that corrupting, rotting, maggot-ridden, slime, ugh, so that the death of that man became his death. The same corruption that was hanging on his back that he couldn't get rid of ate into his body. The maggots got in his body. The rot got in his system. So the thing that he was carrying killed him because he was guilty. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then the next line, 8-1, thanks be to God who giveth us the victory. There is therefore now no how can there be no condemnation when the things you would do, you, you don't do. The things you would not do, you do. You still have a fleshly human fallacy, and yet Paul says you're not guilty. You are free. You are acquitted. The verdict comes back not guilty. The verdict comes back. 
See, I preached that message that when you repent of your sins, you are water baptized. You, you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, everything you've ever done in your past is we erase the board up until this evening. Right? Now, you are, boy, we should have shot them right there. <laughs> After I started receiving a revelation of the grace of God, I realized we should have put them under the water and held them until the bubbles stopped coming up. Because right at that moment, they were saved. Secure. And as soon as they got out of the baptistry and got in the car and went to the house, oh, my God. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. They're human beings. They're doing things. They're saying things. You know, you know I, my whole pastor was trying to put out fires, you know. Did you hear about what so-and-so did? You hear? I heard the other night that so-and-so, oh, these folks have had this problem. And, oh, yeah, they're fighting and the kids are, and they're divorced and this is going on. All, all this human stuff going on. And so we're always trying to get them to come back and pray back through. You follow what I'm saying? You got to, what, what does that mean? That means, okay, I'm saved and then I'm lost. And then I'm saved and then I'm lost. I've told you my, you know, when I, I, when I was in high school, it was a terrible situation for me because here I was loving God, loving everybody, wanting to do right, felt like God was wanting to use me. <laughs> My mother gave me great advice. She said, Marky, that was my name. Marky, here's what you do. When you have bad thoughts and you do things you shouldn't do, put your head down on your desk and just plead the blood of Jesus and ask the Lord to take those things away because the Lord could come at any moment and you don't want to get caught, you know. Are you okay? You, you follow what I'm saying? And so I'd be sitting in study hall, and I was doing perfectly fine. Praise God. I love you, Jesus. And then this real pretty girl would walk by. i go, oh, Jesus, forgive me, oh, God. Jesus, I rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. Now I'm saved. Wow. I finally got back, back into the good grace of God, okay? And I was just feeling good about myself, and then she walked back by. I'm lost again. I'm going straight to hell, I can tell you that. And I became a great preacher on hell. I became a great preacher on judgment. I became, I was renowned in the world. They called me from all over the world to come and preach and scare the devil, to scare the hell out of everybody. <laughs> That's right. And then I came on these terrible scriptures. There is therefore now no condemnation. And I started saying, well, no, 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 as long as I can just do right and stay in Jesus. And then it, it started dawning on me. I could not in my flesh ever, I could never do well enough. Paul already said it. He said, the things I would not do, I do. The things I would do, I do not. He's already confessing that in his flesh there is no good thing, nothing. And then I start reading some of his other stuff. He writes to Titus, there's therefore no, no condemnation of the Romans. He gets over and he says, not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy. He saved us by the washing and regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And so when I, when I started putting this all together, this revelation of grace broke on me. He saved me, not by anything I did. And then it dawned on me, I didn't do anything to get lost. Just get born. When I got born into this world, I was born into sin. Because I was in Adam, by one man's sin, centered into the whole world. So I am born in sin. What did you do to lose yourself? Nothing. You just happened to be here. Then the next question is, if I didn't do anything to lose myself, what can I do to save myself? Nothing. 
And if I could do something to save myself, if I could do anything to save myself by any works or anything, his death was meaningless. He didn't need to die. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, but you, you understand what I'm saying? This is the point I'm trying to get to. I called one of my good buddy friends who pastored another large church. I was beside myself because I am saved. I am going to be saved. I'm not going to be lost. I'm not going to hell. I've sent my sins on before me to judgment. Are y'all still here with me? I am secure. Yeah, you follow me? I called him and I said, you got to come. He got on a plane and flew. He said, I said, I've got the most phenomenal revelation. That because we didn't know, you know, we didn't know anything about grace. We knew a whole lot about hell, but we didn't know a whole lot about grace. <laughs> you know, where the worm dieth not. <laughs> And the fire is not quenched. My God, you better get it right, brother. I remember a time when a man had his opportunity. He stood with his knuckles white on the back of the pew. I gave the invitation, but he said no. On his way home that night from that revival meeting, he was in a head-on collision. Right now, he is roasting in the fire. Man, I, I could make hell so hot. You could, you could smell it. It smelled like rotten pork burning. <clears throat> this is my pastor friend. This is somebody I can confide in. And I said, listen, you got to listen to this. So I started telling him, you know what? I was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. The only reason I'm here right now, if he had not, I would not even be saved. I would not even be knowing him if he had not preordained my being here. The very fact that I am here, Kenneth, the very fact that I'm here means <laughs> he chose me. Not only that, he knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb. Not only that, but hey, you know what? He didn't just call me to the minister or call me to do the work that I'm doing just because I got saved. Hey, he called me to do that before I was ever born. He already had in mind who I was. He came to get, I told you that when I was here last time. He did not save me because I was lost. Anybody remember? Boy, that, that, that still shuts everybody down really cold. He saved me when I was lost, but he did not save me because I was lost. He saved me according to his own purpose and grace, which he purposed in himself before the world was, before there was a world, before I was. He already had eternally purposed who I was and what I was going to become in the kingdom of God. So I'm unloading all of this and saying, you know what? He saved me. And he didn't just save me, but he washed me. And he acquitted me. Past, present, can I, can I say it? And future. I said, that's the good news, Kenneth. That's the good news. The gospel is good. It's not bad news. It's good good news. What I could never do, what the law could never do. He did it for us. He has washed us completely. Past, present, future. He said, ooh, he said, man, you are in heresy. And the next thing he said was, that's too good to be true. If I were going to take a text somewhere, that's what I'd take. Too good to be true. Because we consider that, see, it never, but then it never dawned on him, not to this moment, but it dawned on me the reason why I love him so much. The reason why I can praise him for his magnificent person, for his unbelievable person happenings in the earth, the reason why I want to glorify him, the reason why I want to dance, the reason why I want to sing, the reason why I want to, to do well, 
the reason why I want to bring my flesh into alignment with my spirit. Even though my flesh may wander, even though my flesh may have a struggle, my spirit is pure. He has washed me. Are you still here with me? If I get off course here, Pastor, you can straighten me out. But you said I could teach on. He has reconciled me. He has justified me. That means that he has tallied the books, not just one time until I do something else. And now I've got a deficit. And then I do something else. Now I've got a deficit. This is not a bank statement. So much taken, so much put back in. So much taken. No. He once and for all erased it, put my name down and said, I'm going to put him in me. So that any time the justice of God makes a requirement on this man, they have to see me. If, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Not because he does everything right. Because he's in the new creation. So by one man's sin, death entered into the whole. But by one man, say by one man, not by what I do, but by what he's already done. Pastor, I'm preaching to the choir here. This, you know, this seems common to these folks because you've been preaching it. You've been saying, oh, just go ahead. <laughs> see, I'm, con I'm convinced now. See, that's why I wish Paul were here because you'd believe him. I am persuaded. Let's all say I'm persuaded. I'm persuaded. No, 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 no. Say I am persuaded. I am persuaded that neither life nor death, watch this, nor principalities or powers, angels, things present, things to come, anything happens in my life, anything that goes on in my family, Anything goes on in my job, I am persuaded that nothing, that nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Now I want to praise him. See, I, that's why I told you, that's the axle. When that burns on you, so now it's the goodness of God that makes me want to turn around. It's the goodness of God that leadeth men to repent, not the fear of hell. It's the goodness of God. So I preached a good part of my first ministerial experience, preaching people get right because of fear. Get right because if you don't, you're going to be lost. So they got saved, but I had to keep them saved. So my whole ministry is based on, can I keep you saved? Can I keep you, can I make sure you don't say bad stuff? Can I make sure you don't think bad thoughts? Can I make sure you don't go to bad places? Can I make sure you don't eat bad stuff or drink bad stuff? Or wear bad stuff. Or go where bad people are. So my whole Christian ministry was based on trying to guard these precious sheep and keep them doing. Let's all say doing. Doing the right rather than being in him. I was so busy trying to get people to do the right thing. Because I was convinced that his grace was dependent on my works. If I do good, he loves me. If I don't do bad things, then I can stay in him. Yeah, see... Our problem, that's why I wish Paul was preaching this morning. Because he would say, I think probably he would say, well, here's the situation, okay? Um, where there is no law, 
There's no transgression. What does that mean? Well, let me ask you this. Was it wrong? Was it a sin for Cain to kill Abel? Not at that time. Because where there is no law, there's no transgression. Was it wrong? Yeah. You, you follow me so far? What, was it bad that Cain killed Abel? Was it murder? Yeah. Okay. But where there is no law, there's no transgression, even though you do bad. Let me ask you something else. What if the law is grace? If you do bad, is it bad? If you do bad in your flesh, is it bad? Will you suffer in your flesh? Will you pay a penalty in your life? Will you have trouble in the flesh? But the question is where the law has been taken away, is there any transgression? No. Because he fulfilled the law. He paid for that. Even though you will in your life struggle because of things you do or things you say. You say, well, yeah, well, it's not a sin. Well, if it is a sin and sin is revealed by law, then the law also has been fulfilled or the penalty has been fulfilled because Jesus paid it all. Now, this, see, this is where I get in a lot of trouble. Uh, can I talk about love a little bit? Okay, well, I can't talk about love or the law of love unless I talk about the other laws. Remember, I just got through saying, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. That's what set me free. It hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What's the law of sin and death? You sin, you die. You sin, you die. She walks by. I'm going to hell. I pray, I'm going to heaven. She walks by, I'm going to hell. Sin and death. And it was sin. Oh, yeah. In my mind, oh, it was serious sin. I mean, sh hey, I was 16 years old, 17 years old. It was sin. I promise you. It's bad. But I got it all right there in about five minutes. You know, I had it all straightened out. Then now it's sin again. Sin, death, sin, death, sin, death. I lived my whole life every night. Oh, when I got on an airplane, when I, I was a pastor, I got on an airplane, I say, Lord, I want you to wash me in your blood. And if this plane goes down, <laughs> I, I, I just want, I want to be sure that I got everything right. I want you to forgive me, Lord, for, you know, for this. And, and I know I had some bad, I said some things this week that I, I answered some ways I shouldn't have, you know, my attitude. But Lord, just, just wash my attitude, wash my mind, wash my, well, I should be doing that anyway. I should want my flesh to come into alignment with, but my spirit, see, I was considering this law of sin and death. This is the struggle, is in Christianity where you have grace, but you still have law. We are not free from the law of sin and death. In Christ, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is that he paid the price. My sins are gone. Not only what I did, but what I'm doing and what I will do is already paid for. He has justified. That means he has brought the balance to level. I am justified. He has reconciled. Let's all say reconciled. He's reconciled. The reason why, now, now this takes me back. This, the reason why is because the justice of God demands and requires penalty for sin. God is a God of righteousness. You cannot sin and not have a penalty, right? You cannot. I'm boring these people to death. Am I boring you all to death? You, okay. You cannot 
do evil and not have a penalty. Now, the, in the flesh, people are going to suffer in the flesh for things they do. But in my spirit, my whole spirit, if I do what I'm not supposed to do, there's got to be a penalty paid for that. Right? That's right. There's got to be. Now, why was that? <clears throat> it's all based in another law. Because there are three laws, not just two. One is the law of sin and death. You sin, you die. Then we've got another law, the law of spirit of life. And How many laws did I say there are? Three. Okay. So what's the first one? Law of sin. You sin, you die. And that's the one where we keep trying to get right all the time. If I live right, then I'm saved. If I don't live right, I'm lost. Okay. Sin and death. Sin and death. Paul said, I would not have known sin but by the law. If it hadn't been for law, I wouldn't have known what was sin and not sin. So actually what the law did, the law did not create sin. The law only showed what sin was. It showed that if Cain kills Abel, that's sin. That's wrong. The law made evil sin or what God considers falling short of what he has set as the mark. So am I, am I clear on that? Okay. So the law... For example, under Moses and the law, the law of tithing, 10%. 10. I don't think it's just a percent, but 10. We say, well, the tithe was the law. That was the law. Really? Well, it was the law because the law showed what it was and what it was for. But do you remember the 500 years before the law? Just like Cain killed Abel, that was wrong, but it was known to be sin after the law. Well, Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek 500 years before the law. And Jacob said when he saw the latter, if you return me to my father's, say father, to my father's house in peace, then I will give you a tenth of all that I possess and you will be my God. That's before there was a law. So it was God's plan before it was law. All the law did was make it a commandment rather than an honor. So if the law made sin sin, the law also made righteousness righteous. The only problem was it was only a righteousness that could be upheld by what men did. If I do right, I'm okay. If I don't do right, I'm not okay. That's the law of sin and death. Jesus comes along, pays the price, dies on the cross, and now most Christians live in this second dimension. The law of sin and death is replaced by the spirit of the law of life in Christ Jesus. Okay, so if I can, then, then, they, then they get this mixture. If I can stay in him, I'm okay. If I can walk after the spirit, not after the flesh, I'll be all right. They don't understand that he didn't just give you another way out. He gave us the way out. It's not another way. It is the only way. Am I making any sense to you at all? But then you read in the New Testament that there's another law. The Bible calls it the royal law. Let's all say the royal law. If it's royal, it belongs in what? A kingdom. Yeah, it's a kingdom. Now let's all say kingdom law. And that is the Bible says that all the law and the prophets hang on this one thing. You love your neighbor as yourself. If you love somebody, you don't have to go back and keep law. If you love somebody, you're not going to kill them. If you love somebody, you're not going to steal from them. If you love somebody, you're not going to go and take their wife. If you love somebody, you're going to honor your mother and father. If you, you follow me? So if I live in a third law, in the law of love, then all this other, the first law didn't work, Jesus fixed it in the second, and you live it in the third. I'm going to do that again. In the first one, he showed you what was bad. In the second one, he fixed it for you. And in the third one, you live it. That's why the whole government of grace is love. The government of the kingdom is love. That's why you say, if you love somebody, you're not going to gossip about them. If you love somebody, you're not going to, you say, well, yeah, but I saw what she did, and I know what she did. And you, Well, but you're not going to judge them. If you judge them, you become guilty. Whoa, this is what happens in grace. If you judge what he has already forgiven, 
your fingerprints are on it. That's why offense is such a terrible problem in Christianity. People get offended, and then they borrow offense. Somebody did that to this one, and that, that one, so I can't be their friend because I don't like them because of this or that. And the bad thing about that is he takes our sin, the Bible said, he has cast it into a sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered against us anymore, never. And then somebody comes, goes out, digs it all up, comes walking up, and so really what happens, see, when Satan accuses, he's the accuser of the brethren, when he accuses you, you don't even have to go to court. I'm going to do that again. When you have done something in your life you should not have done, okay, and the justice of God requires an answer, and Satan says, yes, she did. She did it. She, she did that. You don't even have to go to court. Your attorney goes for you. Here comes Jesus, my counselor. Hallelujah. And so Satan says, she did this and this and this. She went out to the bar. She got drunk. She did that. She got, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Jesus says, nope. Yes, she did. Mm -mm. There's no condemnation. There's no, there can't be any judgment. Why? Because she's dead. She couldn't have done it. She's dead. What do you mean? No. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things what you're above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection, your love on things above, not on things on earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. What really happened was when you got saved, when grace appeared to you, when you gave your life to Jesus, he put you into a witness protection plan. He took away your old identity and hid you hid you in Christ. Woo! So Jesus walks up and said, I'm a witness. She's dead. She couldn't have done that. Why not? Oh, yes, she did. No, no, she couldn't. The bad thing is when some old saint stands up and says, yes, she did. I saw her. You become a witness for the prosecution. And when you do, you immediately... You immediately are on the wrong side of justification. In my opinion, the greatest sin that can be sinned by a saint is to be a witness for the prosecution. Because Jesus said, no, no, no. Can't be. Well, where is she? She's buried. We're buried with him. Well, where, where is she? Well, she's hidden in Christ. For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. That way, so when Christ, who is our life, appears before the bar, then shall you also appear with him in glory. She appears through him as being glorious, no matter what she did in her flesh. Now I'm in trouble. Just like Ken said, it's too good to be true. <laughs> way too good to be true. You say, well, you're just giving the people a license to sin. You know my answer for that. You've heard me tell No, people sin without a license every day. <laughs> Don't need a license to sin. They sin with or without a license. No problem. But the fact is that Jesus paid for it. And that should, in every Christian's mind, the good news is this. The good news is if he paid for that, knowing who I am, knowing what I can and cannot be, knowing I cannot be righteous in my flesh. There is no good thing in me. I'm sorry. I know you think you are so good, but the truth is that in your flesh there is no good thing. I'm sorry. I know you think that you are without fault, but you are full of fault. You are full of flesh born into this world has 
You say, well, I haven't done a thing. Yeah, but what you been thinking about? Where's your mind been? Where's your heart been? Where's your attitude been? If I could have fixed all of that by things I can or cannot do, he would not need to have come. There would have been no need for him to die. And that's why if you stand up before the, and you keep repenting over and over again for the same thing. Now, to repent means to turn away from. But really, John the Baptist said, the lamb is coming. Once the lamb gets here, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not just repenting from sin. It's repenting unto the kingdom. Nah, I lost you. I'm turning from sin. How many times have I done this right here in this space? I'm turning from sin. Now, I'm from it. I'm trying to get away from it. I don't want sin to have dominion in my mortal body. I don't want it to reign. Say, I don't want it to reign. I don't want it to become king. I want him to become king. Okay? That's why my growing in great, growing in great, we'll talk about it tomorrow, growing in grace and knowledge means that the more I understand about his grace, the more my flesh comes into alignment with his redemption. The less I know about grace, the more I'm prone to sin. That's why if you preach sin, people sin. Because you preach a sin consciousness. And they are constantly conscious of what they're doing and not doing as being good or evil. But if I preach grace and the love of God, I want so much more. His, see, because now I'm not just repenting from something. I'm doing the same thing. I'm turning, but I'm repenting unto something. I'm not just trying to get out of the law of sin and death. I'm trying to get into the law of love. I got sidetracked a little bit when I started talking about how the bad thing in the world is that when I go out and dig, I'm going to do this again. If I go out and dig up somebody else's fault or their sin, and if I come walking in with that suitcase into the courtroom, okay, and I set it down and say, Your Honor, I was there. I saw her. I saw him. He did it. He said that, boom, evidence right here. My attorney says, would you check the fingerprints, please, on that bag? The only fingerprints on there, see, mine were washed away because I got put into the witness protection plan because I'm in grace. The only fingerprints on that old sin are yours. You dug it up. You're the one who drug it into court. They check the fingerprints and say, oh, so you're the one who did that. No, I didn't do it. She did it. No, no, no. You, you, your fingerprint. You become guilty of that which you accuse others of. With whatever measure you meet, it shall be meted unto you again. You become guilty of the crime you accuse a saint of God of. How are we doing so far? <laughs> now I've got to go back and say that grace doesn't make sense. Redemption doesn't make sense. Reconciliation doesn't make sense unless I understand the very nature and character of God. Because a whole bunch of stuff don't make sense to me. For example, something that doesn't make sense to me is the finished work of God if I don't understand the whole total thing. Think about it like this. Do you think that God knows the end from the beginning? Let me see hands. You do. Okay, you sure? So he knows the future like you know the past, right? So he knows what everybody's going to do and how they're going to do it. When did he start having that knowledge? Did he learn that in college or did he have that from the beginning? Oh, so if he had that from the beginning, now I've got another problem. Because if that's the case, then he creates a man, right? And then a woman. 
puts them in a garden. They are precious, wonderful, sweet, sinless. And he says, you can have everything in this garden. Now, wait just a minute. There are a couple of trees out there. I don't want you to eat from those. The tree of life, and then there's a tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. So don't eat from those two trees. Now, does God know everything in advance? Yes. Does he want us to be holy? Yes. Does he want us to do good? Yes. Did he know that they would sin? Yes. Then why did he put those trees there? Because he could have fixed the whole thing, wouldn't have had to die on a cross, wouldn't have had to do anything. Don't need a cross, don't need, no. Don't need to go to church, don't need to get baptized, don't need to do nothing. Just, hey, just leave the trees, don't put them out there. He's the one who created all the trees. So he created the tree of knowledge, good and evil. He created the tree of life. Set it out there and knew that they'd go eat. So I've got a real serious problem about this whole thing. Here's a God who knows the end from the beginning, a God who knows the future just like you know the past, all of this. And he goes out there, and then he says stuff like this. I create the light, and I create the darkness. Whoa. If you like light so much, Lord, how come you're creating darkness? In him was light, and the light was the light of men. The light shined in the darkness. Well, why'd you make darkness? Then you don't have to shine the light into the darkness. If you don't want anybody eating off a tree, don't make it. I mean, you're the boss. You're in charge. Well, I put those trees out there, but I didn't think they'd go eat. Really? You're God. You forget? You're God. You know the infant bigger. You knew they're going to go. As a matter of fact, Christ was slain. Oh, he already... He already pre-planned. Now I'm really confused. So we've got a God who knows all things in, in the beginning. We've got a God who wants everything to be right. He does not, he hates sin. The Bible said he is angry with the wicked every morning. He abhors evil. The Bible said he abhors evil. Means to hate deeply evil. And yet he creates the light and then makes, I create the good and I create the evil. Uh, okay, that's it. I don't need a God who is schizophrenic. I don't need a God who has got real mental issues. I want you to be holy. I want you to be right. I want you to be good. You're so clean. You're so precious. I'm going to put a couple of trees out here. Don't eat them. Okay. I know you will, but don't. I mean, what kind of a God is that? And then you got people in the world say, well, if there is a God, why are they killing little babies? If there's a God, how come war is going on? People shooting each other. I don't believe in no God because if there was a God, there wouldn't be war all over the place. We wouldn't be out there. Look at ISIS out there cutting heads off of people, and we can't decide whether we're supposed to go to war or we're going to have some kind of a terror thing or what. I mean, I mean, why, 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 why are governments, why is Israel and, I mean, you know, I, I, they're shooting rockets into Israel, and Israel's going down there and bombing. I mean, if there's a God, I mean, <laughs> why, why would... you ever hear any of that kind of stuff? I'm going to tell you why. Okay? You ready? Real easy. Because of who he is. Why are we having a war? Because of who God is. Why are we having a war? Why, why, why do men do evil? Because of the very basic nature of God himself. Now it's quiet. What is the very basic nature of God? God is... Oh. God is... This is a God who lacks nothing. Listen how quiet it is here. This is a God who is all complete, we think. Here's a God that you cannot add anything to. He could add himself by himself, subtract himself from himself, multiply himself by himself, divide himself by himself, and never be more or less. 
He is the all-sufficient one. He is the everlasting one. He is the mighty God. What is his basic nature? God is what? God can have anger. God can have it. We have emotion. That's why we made in the image of God. God in Christ can weep over Jerusalem. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. Have emotion. Sorrow. Regret. Wish. Hope. Anger. Oh, the wrath of the Lamb has come. How can the Lamb have wrath? I mean, so all of this. But that's not who he is. He is love. All of those things are the product of if he didn't love Jerusalem, he wouldn't have been crying over it. You understand what I'm saying? So his basic nature is God is love. There's only one thing about that. The God who can lack nothing lacked something. The God who is all sufficient was insufficient. The God who is and was everything was not all things. And the reason why is because of its very nature. Love is not love. And is not complete unless it has something on which it may place itself. Love can never be measured and known as love. You say, well, well lo God was lonely. The only reason you can have loneliness is because it is the absence of love. Or the absence of one part of love. And so the very nature of God was to love. And yet, with all that he had, all that he had made, why would he make a man? Why would he make a woman? Why would he make them in his own image? Because nothing else has the ability to love. It can have instinct. It can have a nature to do certain things. A deer has instincts. It has a nature to do certain things, go certain places, walk on certain paths. You say, well, look how that mother loves its baby. That's an instinct. That's not an emotion. Only a human being has the ability to truly love. Are you all following me at all? And love cannot be fulfilled unless it has something on which it may place itself. And so God made something on which he could place his love. And that's when he made you. Because he is not fully God unless he can give love and receive it back. You still here with me? And so, he... <laughs> Are you okay? Boy, it got so quiet in here. Wow. Are you following me at all? And so his very nature drove him to create something that could receive love and then return love. Because love is not fulfilled unless it is returned. But it cannot be returned unless it has something on which it may place itself. Like It's like a depth finder on a fishing boat. It goes, boom, hits the bottom, comes back. It's like radar. Boom, it hits a plane, comes back. It becomes a blip on the screen. There's no blip on the screen if there's nothing for it to touch. If love goes out and there's nothing for it to touch, then it just keeps going out, going out, going, and empties itself. And then it goes out and out and out and becomes emptier and goes out and out and out and becomes emptier and goes out and out unless it can hit something. Boom. And then something comes back. So God was unfulfilled because of who he was. He was love and could not be fulfilled unless he had something on which he could place himself and have it come back. And then the next facet of love is love is not love at all unless it has a choice. It has to choose to come back. That's why the boy will say, oh, you look really pretty this evening. You look really nice. Yeah, yeah. He, what's he doing? He's trying to court this girl. I love your hair. Oh, your eyes are like deep pools of water. Listen to old Solomon. Her neck was like an ivory tower. Now, he said some other stuff, too. I, I, probably, I won't go into any more detail on it because evidently he was looking at more than we're supposed to be looking at. But 
<laughs> you follow what I'm saying? And so what happens? After a while, he's looking for her to give something back. I really like you too. You do? Woo. Now we've got something going on. Let's all say, well, we've got something going on. See, God didn't have nothing going on until he had something that could feed. I think I'm, I'm losing this battle, am I? And love cannot be love unless it has a choice. And so he put the choice out there and said, look, keep walking with me in the garden. Keep walking with me in the cool of the day. Let's keep this. But he already knew that man was incapable. And so he already planned a plan so that he could redeem or buy us back. But the whole point was in buying us back, what if he just brought us back to our natural state? If all he did was redeem our bodies, then we start over again in the garden. But if he redeems your spirit, are you all still here? If he redeems your spirit, if, and he says, I'm doing this once and for all, so that nothing that you're doing, see, that's what people say, I don't believe in eternal security. Well, I believe I'm eternally secure in him. I'm sorry. But I truly believe that I am complete. Let's all say complete. In him. I'm not complete in myself, but I'm complete in him. Because what he did was he took away the possibility of my, in my spirit, of going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. He took that all away. When he paid the price, he paid the price for past, present, and future so that regardless of what my flesh does, my spirit stays in tune with him. I am complete in him who is the head of all principalities and powers. I am forever forgiven. I am forever pure. It's pretty quiet in here right now. <laughs> well, what else you want me to do? I got three minutes left. What I really need to do is to say, it seems too good to be true. Because in my flesh, knowing my weakness, knowing my frailty, the first thing I say is, Oh, man, what a big excuse. That's because forever and ever we have preached the law of sin and death. We really have never grasped, we've never really grasped the grace of God. Yeah. You know the grace of God. This, I wish Paul were here. How that he who was rich for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Wow. For what we cannot do because we're weak in the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of God might be fulfilled in us who are not walking after the flesh. We're not judging our flesh who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. I don't know, Pastor, I got them all quiet. I don't know, what did I do? What did I do? Are you all okay? There's therefore now only just a little bit of condemnation. But now. So see, I need, I now I need a lesson now, and that is in something I call self-condemnation. Because Jesus looked at a woman who was caught in the very act of, of adultery. She wasn't, nobody came and said, I got this woman. Somebody said that she, no, no, she was caught in the very act of adultery. And she's thrown down at Jesus' feet. They pick up stones. They're going to stone her to death. Jesus looked at her, and then he wrote on the ground. He did this thing. And then he looked at her and said, woman, where are thine accusers? And she said, Lord, I have none. Let's all say, Lord, I have none. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I'm just telling you that the greatest thing that can ever happen in your life is you say, well, I got saved. That's a wonderful thing. But the whole thing is if it dawns on me what that salvation means, if you know what comes in that package, the Bible says that by grace are we saved 
through faith. It is the gift, and that's what we'll be talking about tomorrow, the gift of God. Finding grace. Finding grace. That Noah found grace. Okay. If I may find grace in thine eyes. David found grace. Come bold to the throne of grace that you may find mercy and grace. You have to find grace. So we'll talk about it tomorrow. You have to find grace. Now, <clears throat> the question is whether or not we can receive the good news and let the good news reign in us. Something happened in my life when that took place. Something happened in my life. All of a sudden, my praise got more powerful. My love got richer. My giving got more faithful. Everything, come on, everything in my Christian life became more exciting because I realized suddenly he's not here to condemn me. He's here to justify me. I am justified by faith. Let's all say justified. I'm justified. What does that mean? What's the word justify mean? Yeah. I don't know anything. My debt is paid. Did I tell you here a while back I went into a group of pastors in a, an organization, about 400 bishops in an old, I guess I could tell you, an old apostolic setting. And uh, this, they're all living under the law of sin and death. And I started singing. I said, I'd like to sing a little hymn before I start this morning. Jesus did his best. I must do the rest. My good works should matter some. I just hope he'll say well done. Jesus did his best. But I must do the rest. No. You want to sing it right? Jesus paid it all. Hallelujah. Stand up with me. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Now, does that give me the license and the right to go out and do anything I want to do? No, 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 no. It's the goodness of God that makes me want to do better. But I don't live under the curse of the law of sin and death. When I come under the law of the love of God, then all of a sudden I can love you regardless I can care for you regardless. You can love me regardless. We don't judge one another out of the flesh anymore. Think about this. One more scripture. You ready? I will know no man anymore after the flesh. But, but wait, there's more. You remember what the next night says? However, we have known Christ after the flesh. But hereafter know we him no more. Let's do that again. I will know no man any more after the flesh. After flesh. No. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, flesh, yet know we him after the flesh no more. What does that mean? That means that his flesh is not here. We did know him after the flesh. Well then, whose flesh is here? We are. And that's why I want to treat you. I want to love you. I want to take care of you as I would take care of Christ. Because you are the flesh of Christ Amen. in the earth. Amen. You are the body of Christ. That's why I don't want to mistreat you. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to say anything bad. I don't want anybody to, to wound you. Because when I look at you, I'm looking at him. Because when justice looks at him, it sees me. The only thing is I appear with him in glory. I love you. I hope I haven't uh, messed you all up today. Amen. Please take your seats for a minute. Amen. Listen, this experience has been my experience. I want to praise more. I want to give more. I want to love more. 
And I am praising more. I am giving more. And I am loving more. It's real. It's real. And that's, what, that's the experience I'm trying to bring all of us into. This is real deal. But not only do you praise more, love more, and give more, much more so comes back onto you. Yeah. It's very real. So this afternoon, let's just honor God. Let's receive an offering. Let's be a blessing to the kingdom of God. The baskets are up here. Um, and as we prepare to do so, yeah, take this away. Uh, Dr. Hamid, do you have 10 minutes, just in case anybody has any questions? Uh, as we give in this offering right now, in a few minutes, if you have a question or something that you want uh, answered, we want to give you the opportunity. We have, it's 12.34. Hopefully, we better hear about 12.45, 12.50, okay? So let's just pray about the offering. We're going to receive the offering, and then thereafter, you can come and grab a mic, ask your question, and I'm glad the only other person other than Paul that I'd rather be here today is here. <laughs> Praise God. And so, Father, we just want to thank you so much for blessing us this morning, establishing your word in such a simple way that we can receive it and understand it. And so we bless you. We thank you. Thank you for your word. And thank you for your people as they respond to the word in their giving. Bless those that do so. Thank you that you multiply the seed back. And we honor and we bless you for your servant that you use this morning. Refresh him. And we bless you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Just come on and you have two baskets here. Thank you. You know, I, I love my... I love my check. Hallelujah. I see grace. Sealed by your sacrifice, I see love reaching for me. Precious blood washes and sanctifies, healing flows, setting me free. I see grace, I see grace, still by, still by your sacrifice. I see love reaching for me. Precious blood, precious blood, washes and sanctifies, healing flows, setting me free. I see grace, sealed by your sacrifice, I see love. Reaching for me, precious blood, precious blood, washes and sanctifies, healing flows, setting me free. I see grace. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me be my, be my. Yes. Thank you so much, sir, for the work. I just have this question. Uh, you said uh, God did not save us because we were lost, that He saved us according to His purpose and grace. Mm -hmm. So, my question is does that mean He has purpose not to save some people? <laughs> That's a good one. Does it mean that he has purpose not to save some people? Because some people, no matter what you say or do, they just want oh, they okay. just don't want to hear you. But if we have been saved according to his purpose and grace, does that mean he has purpose not to save some okay, people? Okay, so see if I understand your question. Does that mean that he has proposed that maybe he won't save some folks? Yes. Yeah. Which comes down to an old Calvinistic idea about predestination. Yes. And that is uh, you can be saved, but you can. You can be saved, but you can. You can be saved, but you can. No, I do. He died for the sin of the whole world. Amen. Okay. Jesus paid the price for everybody to be saved. What I am saying is, those of you who are saved, you know for sure 
that he had a purpose for you before the foundation of the world. Because you wouldn't even be saved if he hadn't had a purpose for you, right? Because he saved you according to his purpose of grace. But he also has a purpose for the lady that checked you out at the grocery store. He also has a purpose for other people in the earth. And I believe the only difference is that the Bible says we, we understand predestination. Whom he did foreknow. Yes. Yep. Them he did predestinate to be conformed in the image of his son. And what that means is that he knew ahead of time, just like he knew that Adam and Eve would sin, he also knows ahead of time that some folks won't say yes to the gospel. That the opportunity is there for them to say yes. That whosoever will, let him come, right? Let's all say whosoever will. Whosoever will. He just knew who would. And it was according to his knowledge of who would that he ordained purpose for us. So why do some of us have the grace and others don't? I'm sorry? Why do some, have why do some of us have the grace and others don't? To understand grace? No. Why do some of us have the grace, the measure of grace, oh, the and seemingly others don't have that measure of grace? Well, the reason why they know what they lack is not grace. They lack faith. That's it. Through faith you That's it. By faith are you saved through grace. Yes. Faith before grace. So they do not have the faith to believe that what he did was for them. Correct. And so if they do not believe what he did was for them, then they cannot enter into that grace. And so they lack grace because they first lack faith. Especially, grace sense? is supplied by God. Yeah. Grace is all on God. Yeah. But man must appropriate faith. Right. to tap into that grace. So the grace is available, but they have not used their faith to appropriate it. Does yes. that make sense? Yes. The Bible said, for it is the gift of God. So if I have a gift and I hand it out, and I say, here, I have a gift for you. No, but let's say you don't take it. Okay. Because this is really a nice, wonderful thing. You say, oh, I don't think there's anything in there. No. No, no, this is for you. I got it for you. And you say, eh, I don't want Unless he receives it. To as many as receive it. To them gave he power. power. That's what, just as Pastor said, grace is the appropriation of God. You can't do that. You can't offer grace. You can't pay for grace. Grace is the gift of God. But you have to receive it. That's why you must have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Because he wants you to be saved. He wants you to have grace. Is that right? Yes. But I must appropriate grace through my faith. Amen. Yeah. So it, it's not it's not as much that God excludes anyone. No. God God provides for everyone. Some of us just opt out of His provision. I like that. And, and, and what you wrote, you mentioned to me a little while ago, was a very powerful point, Pastor. And that is, when we do something wrong, it does not mean we are innocent. It means we're found not guilty. That's good. That yep. is a very powerful point because if I do something I shouldn't do, I know I am wrong. Yes. So I am not innocent. I'm just found not, not guilty. guilty. Yes. So it's not like I can do anything I want to and it doesn't matter. It does matter. Yes. It's just that Jesus paid for it. Yes. But that's what should make me love him so much. Yes. And I, make me not want to do that again. I, I'm back on that point. When I've done something that is wrong. I'm not innocent, but I'm not found guilty. Right. I think the disposition of the believer in that kind of a situation is, in that moment where I know I'm not innocent, I need to say, Jesus, I so much thank you. Yes. Because this is part of what you pay the price for to get me away from this kind of lifestyle. I thank you. This is part of what your redemption did for me. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Not from a condemning perspective, but from a realization of how big and how great and how too good to be true Absolutely. this good news is. And rather than run away from God, run to him and receive more of his grace to help me so that I don't go back to that thing. So it's not a matter of being caught now. It's a matter of you now knowing that you no, 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 no. I'm better than this because of what Jesus did. Yeah, the Bible says, Beloved, if our conscience condemns us not, 
Then have we confidence, confidence. for God. Confidence about what? Confidence that I can do what he asks me to do and fulfill the purpose that he asks me to fulfill. Because what happens is I can take myself out of alignment to the point that I become ineffective for the purpose of God in the earth. Amen. Amen. You follow what I'm saying? Amen. I can become ineffective. If, if I'm not living my life right and I'm not doing right, I'm not going to be effectual in helping other people. Absolutely not. Yeah. And so my conscience either excuses or condemns me. It doesn't send me to hell. It just tells me I'm not in alignment with God's purpose and makes me want to come back and as pastor said makes me to rush into remember he's a father yes. I should be rushing to him yes. not away from him yes. religion makes you run from God he was like, I ran from God for years and years you know well that's because they were afraid of God but if he's our father we should run to him amen not from him amen anybody else yes go ahead um, I have three, well, two questions, but before I say that, I just wanted to add to what um, he already said. I heard something um, some time ago that said, grace makes the provision, but faith cashes the check. So basically, people are uh, hoping that, you know, we have the grace of God and everything is just going to work on its own, but like he said, you know, faith is what cashes that check. So just having the check and just going around with it doesn't um doesn't you know mean that you have the money in your hand um two questions first of all i there's a scripture that says as god's co-workers we urge you not to receive god's grace in vain i've always wondered what that passage meant if you can throw more light on that and then secondly when you were talking about um when the enemy comes to accuse you and your attorney um you know, goes to court for you. You said something about the worst thing that we can commit is being a witness for the prosecutor. Can you say that one more time? <laughs> okay, now that's an awful lot in one question. <laughs> First of all, receiving the grace of God in vain. You've got to understand that grace is not in vain. His grace wasn't in vain. It only becomes in vain if I do not apply it in my life so that I become valuable in the kingdom of God. You can never say that God in his grace is vain, that his grace is no good. His grace is always good. How I respond to that grace yes. is questionable. If I respond by allowing my spirit to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, then I learn more and more and more about his grace. The more I learn about his grace, the more I'm going to want to be like him. You understand, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Uh, so to receive it in vain means that he gave it to me, but I did not accept it or use it. Maybe I didn't cash the check. Yeah. Yep. To use your own term. Amen. Now, what was the next part of that question? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Um, talking about like when the enemy comes to accuse you and your attorney goes to court for you, um, and you said the worst thing we can commit is to be a witness for the prosecutor. Okay, now, help oh. me understand that question. Okay, when a brother accuses, when somebody accuses a person, yeah, and you go, the, it's like being in the court setting, okay, and you're saying by testifying or pointing or accusing that individual, it's like testifying for the court prosecution. Yeah, she wants more. Well, first of all, if we are, if we are malignant, if we are accusers if we are trying to bring condemnation on ourselves remember you have to deal with this in your own mind too because your own mind condemns you if our conscience condemn us not you know we can be constantly condemning ourselves and then some folks live condemning others rather than condemning someone else we should recommend the grace of God to them hmm. I'm gonna say that again rather than condemning hmm. them I should recommend the grace of God to them. I should, I should constantly be saying of my brother and sister, you know, I want them to receive the grace of God. It doesn't mean that I do not recognize or they may not recognize in me weakness. You understand what I'm saying? It doesn't mean we don't recognize weakness or even failure. Hmm. But what we do not do is we do not condemn them. We recommend the grace of God. That's what Paul said. He recommended the grace of God to certain people and 
what he's really saying is, listen, you need to go back under the covering of grace and you need to allow grace to work in this so that this thing will fix itself and heal itself because you cannot become the condemner of that if Jesus has already become the fixer of it. Hmm. Wow. So I think we should recommend grace. Amen. If, my bro if, if Pastor saw something in my life that was not right, he'd say, he say, Pop, you know what I really feel? I feel like, you, need, you know, God has been so good to us uh, and, and he has so much grace. I feel like you need to really, you, you need to fall under that grace and let God work that thing in your life. You know? That's that Christ sanctifying love. That's what he's talking about. Yeah. The Thank sanctifying God. love yeah. does not condemn. No. It corrects, yes. but with love rather than condemn. And that's the kind of relationship that God is encouraging between husband and wives. Where we can correct one another, but do it in the sanctifying way, whereby I'm not putting my wife down, or my wife is not putting me down, but with in love, very gentle and tenderly, bring correction to one another. Yeah, but, it certainly doesn't mean that we don't need correction. It doesn't mean that we don't need guidance. Yes. It doesn't mean that we don't need guidelines. It yes. doesn't set us all free to just be loose and run around and do any old thing we want to do. It doesn't yes. do that at all. Yes. Well, first of all, we should be guarding our own life. Next of all, we should become guardians, not condemning one another, but for each other. Amen. But you can only do that in the third law. Amen. And that's love. Yes. If you do it, this, if you do it the first law, you condemn it in the second law, you tell them it's possible, but only in the third law can you live it out. Amen. Good. Thank you, Papa. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. We, uh, uh, Papa's going to be here tomorrow morning, uh, so we just want to encourage all of you that can be here to be here. But not only that, bring your friends. He's going to be talking tomorrow morning. You said again about how to... Uh, the gift. Grace being the gift. Yeah. Tomorrow. Is that, is that what you... Yeah, we're going to find grace. We're going to find grace tomorrow. As Noah found grace. grace. Amen. Amen. So come find some grace tomorrow now. God bless you. We love you. Have a great day. See you tomorrow. Amen. Amen.